How's it going, people? Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another Box to Box. I say this every week and it's not going to change. The games are coming thick and fast. Thursday, Sunday, Thursday, Sunday, Thursday, Sunday, all up until the World Cup. And I'm joined today by a Southampton fan and goes by the name of Mike. How you, how you doing, Mike? I'm doing good. Yeah, very good after we uh, finally got a win in the week. So, yeah, feeling a bit better now. Just our luck, you picked up a win just before. I'm <laughs> but we will get into it, or we will get into it. Or Mike um, has his own channel called Match Day Vlogs. I am going to pin it in the title, and he's going to tell you more at the end of the show, as usual, people. But listen, show some love to the guests, as always. A lot of good comments week in, week out. I always go through the comments. Love for the love, as always. Show the same love to Mike and his channel in the description, in the title. And we move. Mike, you just said it. You just picked up a win, your first win in six, seven games. Um off the back of a draw as well, obviously you lost a fair few and then you picked up a draw at home to West Ham and then a big away win at Bournemouth 1-0. Talk to us about how you're feeling at this moment in time as a Southampton fan. Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, so getting a win in the week was big for us, but it was hardly convincing. I think there were a few open areas where we we still got a lot of concerns. Uh, the West Ham game at the weekend on Sunday uh, was arguably something we could have held out for a win. Um, but we're just allowing too much uh, of opposition control, really, and too many shots on target into the box, all that kind of stuff. We're not closing down like we once used to. So, um, But prior to that, it's it's been really disappointing, if I'm honest. it's It's been a real struggle to watch Southampton play in the sense that we had three games that, no disrespect to our position, we should have been winning them. You know, yeah. we were away at Wolves that really weren't showing us anything to be too worried about. Um, and we, they were all opposition that we should have been beating had we turned up on the day, you know, with the exception of the Man City away, where that was just wasn't even competitive. If I'm completely yeah. honest, it was uh, yeah. very few, very few can compete with them. Yeah, no, it's kind of a. I was kind of hoping that you guys were going to be playing them this week, so you'd be on on a downward path. But yeah, you kind of <laughs> dodged that one. But uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a blessing. I can't lie. There's a lot of fans that. That, you know, in hindsight, looking at our form and, and maybe looking at Manchester City's performance against Liverpool, saying, oh, we should have had the game now. But the rally is Manchester City, whether you play them now, whether you play them later, it's always going to be a difficult game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think it was a blessing to, to have that pushback. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Um, but... Mike, I want to ask you, because Ralph Hasenhutl, three, four years ago, you know, his name was being touted as potentially the next manager to be given a chance at maybe one of the big six clubs or at a bigger club competing in Europe. Um, a lot of rave reviews about him. What's happened since? Because, you know, the the hype, let's call it, around his name has, has kind of died down. I'm not hearing much about him. Mm -hmm. Southampton, a bit of disarray at the moment. I'm not too sure where you're really going and where you're at at the moment and, and where you've gone in the past few years. So, Mike, talk to me. Hassan Hutu, is he still the man for you? Is it is it a case of the people above have let him down? I think it's a, a combination of things. I mean, you know, you're right in saying that, you know, back in February when, you know, we went away to Tottenham, beaten 3-2, went away to Man United and, and drew 1-1. And around that kind of time period, everyone was kind of looking at Hassan was saying, well, perhaps he should be Ralph Ranić's apprentice again and become the new Manchester United manager. And I think really, I mean, his tactics lead to some very exciting football. And, you know, I've really enjoyed some of the football I've seen. It's arguably the best that we've had at St Mary's and on the road since the Poch and Koeman days. Um, but what's really been the crux of it is in the sense that our defensive issues, and, and I'm not talking specifically about our defence, it's the fact that we have these big gaps in midfield and we just allow, our, uh, you know, we're very vulnerable to attack which, you know, as we as we know, there's been some quite disastrous uh, results that we've had uh, of late, really. Um, but when Hassan Hüttel came into the side, it was always the case that his tactics were concrete, but the players that he was working with weren't skilled enough to do the methods that he had. So that was always rhetoric back then. But now it's kind of shifted to the focus of, OK, we're not getting these results because he's lost the dressing room or he's doing this or, you know, players aren't playing for him anymore. And really, the the rumor mill of Twitter is spinning all over the place. So, I think I think the honest answer is it, it's just the Premier League is an incredibly competitive league, and if you're not at it, you will get punished. And we yeah. just haven't been able to 
to hold out for wins, you know, or, you know, or even draws in certain cases where we've we've gone ahead and not been able to stay ahead, really. Oh, see, outside looking in, again, you can stop me if I'm wrong. Was there a change of approach this summer? You, you're now the youngest um, average age squad in, in the league yep, at the moment. Right. We're just behind you in second place in, in that department. Um, but it seems like there was a change in approach this summer. If there was, confirm. And mm -hmm. does that change of approach come from Hassan Hutu? Is that something he wanted or is it from above again? Yeah, I mean, we, we had a big, great summer. I mean, I think we could probably say we had the best transfer window we've had for many a year. Um, but it was all very young players. A lot of players going from the Manchester City Academy. Uh, Romeo Lavia, who's unfortunately injured at yeah. the moment, is a massive player for us. I mean, is he out, is he out on Sunday? or is He's still out, Sunday? yeah. We were hoping that he'd be back, um, but it was a hamstring injury, and I think they've just given it a bit more time. Yeah. But his performance against Chelsea when we got that win at St Mary's was was amazing i mean he's just such a talented footballer and when he's like 18 years old and he's able to hold up the play and just dominate in the middle of the park and when he got injured that kind of led to our issues for the following games where we really didn't know what we were doing uh, but in addition to that um i'm old bella cop chap uh, a very young defender from germany um it's been amazing unfortunately he's injured as well he dislocated his shoulder against west ham um uh, you know bazunu coming in from Manchester City Academy. Um, he was on loan at the Blue Half of Hampshire for last season. Uh, did very well. Um, and again, Adozi from Manchester City, Larios uh, coming in. So, But they're all very young players that have, have clearly got talent, but it's just a case of cutting it in first-team Premier League football that is really the step up that I think is leaving a lot of question marks for us. Are you behind this change of approach then as a Southampton fan? Do you think it was something that was necessary considering what you said about Hassan Hutu initially not having the the players that could, you know, accommodate for his system or his philosophy? Is is this the right way to be going about it? I think it has to be. Um, mainly because, you know, speaking very honestly, we can't compete with buying players that are permanently proven because that results in 35, 40 million pound transfer business and that's just sadly not what we're able to compete with yeah. um, due to the money available so the idea of buying young talented players for seven eight million um, you know giving them decent long contracts so that it protects us for when uh, the the top six clubs come in and stick a 50 million quid on the table is kind of the business model that Southampton have you know whether I like it or not it's just what it is yeah so there's no point you know going against it um, but I think it's just a case of that recruitment needs to work for us to work. But we also need to get those players playing together well quickly uh, when we do that. And we've seen some standout performances from, well, going back to Salasu when he joined. You know, he's looking a very yeah. decent player. A lot of eyeballs on him. I think uh, a lot of eyeballs are on Bazunu already. Um, but a cop chat's been linked to Liverpool already and all these kind of things which are already happening. But these players have been put on five-year contracts. So when they do go, hopefully we get big coin for them so we're not so worried about having to replace them and do, do the system again, really. So we talked a bit about Southampton and I've given you my perspective outside looking in. I want to hear your perspective outside looking in at Arsenal now. Um, mm. This is the first time we've spoken, Mike. So I want to you know, put some context behind the question. And when Arteta first came in, a lot of doubters, um, I was one of them, the, the inexperience, you know, the, the mess of a situation Arsenal were in at the time. I think very few believe that an inexperienced manager could come in and, and be the catalyst for change. But, you know, we sit here right now, 13 wins out of 14 in all competitions, top of the Premier League, four points clear, top of our Europa League group, five points clear, having just dispatched a PSV. Um, what do you what do you make of it all, Mike? Um, how Arteta has managed to turn it around, and and where you feel Arsenal are at at the moment? I mean, naturally, along with everyone else, we've been pretty blown away by what Arsenal have been able to do, and and I think not enough is being made of those results, like going away to Crystal Palace, and you know, going to those places like Leeds and sort of Brentford, yeah. Brentford and all those kind of places where, you know. It, you can get disrupted by that. You know, you can go up against the top six side and you know what they're about. But when you get disrupted by the, the lower lower league position uh, clubs, it can really sort of show you what you're capable of doing. But all in all, I mean, in all honesty, we were kind of, 
way back looking at Arteta's rule and thinking like, well, okay, he won the FA Cup, but really there's a lot of impatience there. Um, but I've been very impressed with the football that we've seen. I mean, you you guys completely demolished us at the Emirates. I think it was 4-0 last season. And and that in itself showed a very fast, progressive, um, counter-attacking football that I think is, uh, you know, really sort of shown, shown what you're about. But I, I think not enough has actually been put on Arteta's, you know, in terms of praise that he's been getting because, let's face it, you know, it's not really since Arsene Wenger that you've able to have someone that sort of broke the mould, broke the back of of what has been a club which is steeped in glories in its in its historic path, but um, in its past, sorry. But in terms of being able to take them back there, I mean, time will tell, of course. You know, you're only sort of three losses away from pandemonium again, but I think this is... Uh, this is something to look forward to, and and fair credit to the the board at Arsenal for sticking by it and sort of holding out, really, because uh, you know if they listen to the voices of the fans, perhaps we wouldn't be in this position. But to go and win nine ten to nine games out of ten in the Premier League, it's just can't complain at all. Can't complain. There's a lot of green on your your column there. When I was looking down the three, I was like, wow, you know. Yeah, you're looking at our form a little bit. Yeah, I, I get that. Listen. It's been refreshing to say the least as an Arsenal fan. This is definitely our best start to the season in God knows how long. Um, long may it continue. Obviously, um, fans are talking about a potential title challenge. I'm more so looking at you just be comfortable in top four come January, February, and the rest will hopefully take care of itself. I'll analyze it a bit better then. But I completely agree. You mentioned that maybe Arteta isn't getting the credit he, he deserves. Mm. And Arsenal fans in, in particular this season ha- have mentioned how the media have been um, in terms of headlines and, and m- maybe targeting Arsenal in a negative light. Outside looking in as a neutral, do you think it's an Arsenal problem? Do you think the media uh, just don't like giving Arsenal praise? Or do you think that's just part and parcel with how media is nowadays, not just in sport, but how negativity sells and, and controversy sells? Yeah, I think you've got to be careful what you listen to in terms of the media. I mean, obviously, there are, there are always certain agendas, certain pundits out there that have their belief structures and in terms of what clubs have done in the past. Um, but, you know, the, the Premier League has never been this tough before. And, mm-hmm. I, and I think in the case of, you know, no disrespect to anything Man United, Arsenal, Chelsea have done in the past, but when you look at some of the football that's on display in the Premier League today, it is devastating. And it's getting to a stage where you're looking at certain contests, like I was at one at the Etihad a couple of weeks back, where you're thinking like, this ain't even competitive anymore. You know, it's it's seriously tough. So in terms of that you're able to be st- still here, at, you know, 10, 11 games in at the top of the table should give you great confidence. And I think it's down to the players and the manager to maintain that uh, that structure. And, and like I said, you know, what you did away at Leeds... And, away, and it's in those away games that will really show your your title charge mm-hmm. capabilities, because um, that that's that's where it'll be won or lost. It's sort of unfortunately getting a draw or you know not being able to score at certain grounds. So um, that's uh, that's what I'm worried about for Sunday. You know, <laughs> hey, you see, you're worried. Um, in order for Southampton to take something from the game this Sunday, then Mike, um, looking at Arsenal's threats. In terms of key battles on the pitch, what do you have to nullify on Arsenal's side to, to be confident you can take Saturn out of the game? Um, I think in terms of your threats, I mean, Martinelli has been one that I've been particularly wary of. Um, you know, Gabriel Jesus as well up front, being able to sort of, you know, poach goals in the way that he does. Um, our centre-back partnership has been disrupted somewhat, so we'll probably have Coletica and also Salasu in defence. Um, so really I'm not too worried about that centre-back partnership but it's just on either side we'll have Roman Peru likely in the left-back position and then over in the right-back position is where we've got some devastating news which broke this morning is the fact that Carl Walker-Peters is out with a long, long-term long injury and our two uh, right-backs being Tino Livramento and Carl Walker-Peters have been the standout performers of the last two seasons really so it's pretty devastating that that right-back position just is basically going to be fulfilled with a, a winger if I'm completely honest, I can't see anything other than that. I don't think Ralph is going to go with three centre backs um, and then with like working with full backs. He might, he might, but you know, I don't think he's prepared to sit back 
because if he if he was thinking that he would have done it against Man City and he didn't do it against them. So I can see us having Musa Gennapo in the right back position. Um, maybe Lewis Payne from the academy. You could see um, a younger player being being put in there. But hey, you've got the uh, the Premier League leaders coming to St Mary's. You, it, it'd be a tough ask to stick in an academy player for his first team start against Arsenal. So, um, but yeah, I think Martinelli and uh, just overall your the the strike force you got. Yeah, you mentioned a fullback is is an area of concern for you guys at Southampton, and and when you look at us, you mentioned Martinelli. I'm going to mention Saka, and and, mm. and more recently in the last few weeks, Saka's really you know kicked on in terms of um, end product goals, assists to start the season. Jesus and Martinelli took most of the headlines, but you know even older guards done his thing and the, a few goals, a couple of assists here and there. Um, in terms of our forward line, it's hard to say where the goals are going to come from in terms of an opposition, which, you know, as an Arsenal fan, I welcome that because it's been a long time since not only have we had goals in the side, but goals from various players as well, which does, has been um, one of the main reasons why we started the season so well. Um, recently, Jesus has, I won't call it criticism, but people are questioning whether he should have more goals, maybe he should finish a few more chances. But my argument is, you know, Saka's getting more chances. Martinelli's getting more chances. Odegaard, look at even Xhaka. Mm. Jesus' introduction has taken the attention away from some other players that allow for more space um, in and around the, the penalty box. So I think even without, you know, his goals in, in recent weeks, Jesus still adds so much to the eleven in yeah. terms of keeping an eye out for him that um it, it bodes well for the other players around him um on your side then mike who is the biggest threat to us arsenal shea Adams is your top scorer at the moment in the league i believe mm -hmm. he's got three goals and i think an assist as well off the top of my head um yeah. on his way to golden boot no doubt <laughs> would he be your main threat then <laughs> he's got about what 12 to go out to catch harland at the moment <laughs> Indeed, indeed. I mean, Erling Haaland's making everyone else look like a goalkeeper up front, aren't they, in terms of their strike force? But um, it is crazy. We won't talk about them. Um, but yeah, I, th I think, um, yeah, Shea Adams would be one to look out for. I mean, he's probably the hardest working player on, the, on our pitch at the moment. Um, he got a, a great goal against uh, Bournemouth in the week, being able to break away and get a header on, on target. A little bit dodgy defending, if I'm honest, from Bournemouth's part. Um, but he's the kind of sort of hard-working player that will probably, hopefully, grab a goal. Um, Roman Peru on that left fullback position um, is has been pretty good. I mean, he got a goal yeah. against uh, West Ham on Sunday, but he's also quite a, a pacey uh, left back. Um, and then in terms of, uh, for, for us, it will be who's going to be working that midfield, you know, without Lavia back, we're probably going to have Diallo and Will Prowse in the centre of the park. Um, but one to watch out for, I'm, a, I'm not sure if he'll get a starting performance, might be Sam Adozi. He's quite a quick, he's been playing on the on the left side of the wing, um, but he's a pretty exciting talent to look at. He came from the Manchester City Academy as well. Um, but when he came on against Wolves for the final 15 minutes, I think he had the most successful dribbles in the entire Premier League weekend. So um, probably one to look out for there. Um, so, yeah. You mentioned the name there, and I was going to move on to prediction next. But before we do, let me ask about that name. Ward Prowse, uh, a player that I've been a fan of over the last few years. Mm. Um, a player that I thought might or still might get a move to in a, a club maybe challenging in Europe and maybe challenging to break into top four. This season, his name hasn't come up as much as... I'm used to it coming up in previous years. Hence why when you mentioned it, it kind of stuck with me. Oh, yeah, you have Ward Prowse as well. Mm. Is it just a case of the team hasn't been playing well and he's just been a part of it? Or has he been playing well and the team let him down? He, In short answer to that, he's not been playing well. Um, but I think it is kind of hard on him because where he's at in midfield, he's been kind of working a role which isn't ordinarily doing playing like a holding position and sort of, you know, covering for players that aren't really doing the jobs that they should be doing. So rather than having a holding midfield player, we've kind of been having like a pivot approach where you've got um player on loan from you guys, Angelie Mate and Niles, and also, you know, occasionally Di Diallo, who would probably be more of a attacking player. So it, it's kind of tough for him because there's been you know opportunities for him to really shine, but really what he's had in front of him to work as a midfield player sort of pushing forward 
the options haven't really been there. He's, he's yeah. not got a prolific striker which you can sort of put a target on and create something with. We've not had many um, free kicks in that opportune area. Um, so there hasn't been many opportunities for him to shine. But in the same respect, even with that, his performances haven't been great, if I'm honest. But I think he's probably been thrown under the bus in terms of what's going on elsewhere with our injuries um so I, I do free, feel for him i i sadly don't think he's going to make the world cup squad at this current yeah. form uh which will be devastating for him because he was obviously uh distraught at missing out on the euros uh, wow. and not being included in that so that that's got to be his goal but with a few games remaining with our injury concerns you never know you know this is international football and many things change very quickly in that regard so Maybe two great performances and an amazing free kick against Liverpool at the Anfield might be enough to get him in there. So we'll wait and see. <laughs> and it's, listen, I know they've got a set piece specialist in Trippier, but it's not a bad idea taking a couple. And Ward Prowse yeah. is, is a set piece specialist. So we'll see what England do. But Mike, um, as the home team, I'm going to ask you for your prediction first. Okay. Uh, my prediction I'm going to go with a repeat of last season. I was amazed when it happened. Uh, last season, if I'm honest, and I'll, I'll be amazed if it happens this season. But um, but I'm going to go for a one nil to Saints. I got back my boys, and uh, okay, we only got one clean sheet so far this season in the fixture we just played. But yeah, if that's how it's going to get done, that's how we're doing it. So there we go, one nil. I'm, yeah, I'm looking at the last few Arsenal games. Obviously, the last three have been one nil wins for Arsenal. Um, a couple of performances that haven't really matched the the earlier performances of the season, but. You know, I think we all expect that as a fan of every club. You know, it's not going to be rosy for 38, 50 games a season and so on. I think we need, as much as Southampton have had an iffy start to the season, I think we're going to, we can't take you lightly. Like you said, you know, you got the W last year. Um, Southampton at St. Mary's in recent history hasn't been the easiest of places to go to for Arsenal. But I'm going to go with a 2 0 win. Um, our defence has really, you know, sh- shored up over the last 12 to 18 months. We're still making silly mistakes here and there. And if you look at the, a lot of the goals we've conceded, off the top of my head, I think the majority of the 10 goals we've conceded in the league have probably been through our own mistakes or our own doing. Now, in the last three, we've managed 1-0 wins where we haven't really performed at the best of our ability. So, credit the defence for that. And I think and I hope that we can keep another clean sheet away, which... We've already done four times out of five this season. United being the only anomaly out of the away fixture so far. So I'm going to stick with a 2-0, Mike, um, and leave it at that. But before we do go, let them know where they can find you. Let them know on Match Day Vlogs, your YouTube channel, what you get up to there, and, and maybe your socials as well, which I'll put in the description. Oh, okay, great, yeah. Yeah, you can find us on matchdayvlogs.com, um, Match Day Vlogs on TikTok, on Facebook, uh, and of course on YouTube, just simply Match Day Vlogs is all there. What we try and do on our, our channel is really capture what it's like to be a Southampton fan in terms of, you know, we have, we have a GoPro set up during the game so you can actually see our raw emotions. So if things go badly uh, at the weekend for us, then it, it's uh, unfortunately provides enjoyment for the opposition as well. As you can the see the pain effect. on your YouTube channel. You can it's see the fun. pain on our YouTube channel and also the where we sit is right next to the away fans as well. So you'll see the... Well, tell you what, you're not going to see the away fans celebrating because it's going to be a 1-0 win like I've already said. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just purely about sort of providing that kind of experience of what it's like to be a Premier League stadium watching watching your beloved football team play and i know we have lots of followers and supporters across the the globe that unfortunately are unable to make it to uh games and you know really appreciate the content that we provide for them to give them an impression of what it's like to be there whether it be good or bad so you know it's something yeah. that we like to I've portray spoken, but yeah i've spoken to quite a few fans across across the world and they really do enjoy match day vlogs um obviously i'm talking about austin in particular but as well as you doing southampton you know it's it's a good service that that you're yes. offering out there. YouTube's a free platform as well. So credit to credit to you for doing what you're doing. And um, keep up Thank the you. good work, Mike. I think we'll catch up again later on this season. We'll get you back on for the um, return leg at the Emirates at the second half of the year after the World Cup. Um, but people, make sure you guys go show some love to Mike. His channel, Match Day Vlogs. I'm gonna put the socials below, uh, MatchDayVlogs.com as well. Make sure you show some love as always, and show some love to this video. Hit the like button. Give us your thoughts in the comment section below, predictions, all of that. 
And as always, love for the love. We'll be back soon. Peace. Shop for AFTV merch at shop.aftv.co.uk. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat, and Twitch. We've got content for every platform, so check it out.